America. My name is Ami Jose Frimpong. It's Memorial Day, so I, you know, wore my colors today. Got to get my colors right because this is my Memorial Day too. I'm going to give you uh, a few minutes to fall in. Yvette is out of town. She's, uh, I think, going to a wedding this weekend. Um, I have a big show planned today. It's going to be fun. I have an interview with Nathan Connolly. He's a professor at um, Johns Hopkins University. And he's going to talk about black capitalism, capitalism and the black imagination, and property rights and how that fits in. First of all, you have to ask yourself, you have to ask yourself a few things about um, uh, why I'm wearing this outfit. First of all, it's Memorial Day. And don't let people tell you that Memorial Day is only for white people. There are a lot of black veterans. There are a lot of black veteran civil rights leaders during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, including Medgar Evers and Robert F. Williams, and heck, even Harriet Tubman during the Civil War. There are a lot of black veterans who wore these colors and did good things for black people. Because here's the deal. There are a lot of white veterans who went off, fought in foreign wars, came back, and joined the Klan. Memorial Day is not for them. Those guys were assholes. Memorial Day is for Medgar Evers, the black veterans who went off, came back, and decided to stand up. And Medgar Evers, uh, you know, he was assassinated while he was registering voters because he was standing up for black people. And uh, this is my way of standing up for him because he was standing up for my right to participate in these United States. Um, Robert F. Williams. Another one, a veteran, a black veteran who came back and decided that he was not going to live on his knees in his land. So that's why I'm wearing these colors today. Um, and like I said, I gotta get my, my colors right. I am an American and don't let, you don't let anybody tell you that you can be an American without talking about us. My colors, just like everybody, Everybody else's colors in America, these are ours. We gotta own them and we gotta claim them. We can't forget about our black veterans who came back from fighting from foreign wars and came back and fought for us. And Medgar Evers, Robert F. Williams, uh, you know, Harry Tubman, um, all count, the, the list goes on and on and on. And a, list, a long list of Vietnam veterans actually came back and did good work in the, in the, in the 80s and 90s. So. These are our colors, and we disproportionately fought in Vietnam, too. That's something they don't tell you. We disproportionately fought, and we disproportionately died in Vietnam. Um, for s so this is our Memorial Day. We own it, we claim it, and out of respect for that, I wore this to remind you that don't let anybody else, got to get my colors right, don't let anybody else tell you that uh, Memorial Day is not for you, or this isn't your country. This is your country. This has always been our country. And sometimes it took a little bit of our blood and a little bit of their blood to remind them of it. So let me see if we've fallen in today. Um, see how we're doing. Oh, hey, y'all. Hey, Lisa, how you doing? Yeah, I just happened to have it. I, I had this around. Um, I don't know. You, you look in your closet and sometimes you have things. I was Apollo Creed for... Uh, for a Halloween a few, a few Halloweens ago. Let's be honest. I've been either Apollo Creed or Black Shaft, or Shaft, or the Black Guy from the Village people for a Halloween for uh, probably 20 years, off and on. So, um, yeah, I had this in my closet. Hey, Yogi Fish, how you doing? Hey, Juanita. All right, and yay, hey, Rob Myers is a veteran. Rob Myers, this is for you. This is for you, this is for Medgar Evers, this is for Robert F. Williams, this is for black veterans who fought for these United States and then came back and were treated like second class citizens because we haven't gotten our politics right. And when I say we haven't gotten our politics right, this isn't just black people. This is the United States of America hasn't gotten its politics right. But I thank you for your service. You fought for these colors. All right, so here is what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. Um, I, feel, I, I feel remiss if I didn't mention um, this cat right here, you might, have, uh, you might have heard of him. He was in a lot of papers. Uh, he was in all the papers for the 90s and 80s. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the twin parallels of Tiger Woods and my lives. All right? So Tiger Woods, 
Uh, there isn't a producer here today, so it's just me. I'm going to be doing some technical stuff while I, while I tell you about these United States. So Tiger Woods is... And I are about the same age. He's like two years older than I am. We both grew up, and well, we both went to high school in Orange County, California. Um, we both went to fancy schools in Northern California for college. He is worth, um, we both have two kids. He is worth about $700 million, whereas I just uh, succeeded in paying off all my student loans. But uh, honestly, when I look at his life and I look at my life, I think I'm winning. And let me, let me tell you how that works. Uh, I'm still married to my wife. So a lot of his $700 million goes to alimony and child support and will probably end up going to his uh, two kids therapy bills going on to the future as those kids end up most probably treating him like garbage uh, because that's often how this works. Um, what else? Yeah, I'm, still hap I'm happily married. I... Uh, have a reasonable mortgage on a house that allows me to have a studio and not only do my work, daytime I'm a graduate student, and nighttime I, I help a vet produce this show and I have a few other projects that, that, that go on. Um, I, I'm not sure when they put us both into the ground, I don't know whose contribution to the black community is going to be greater. Uh, Tiger Woods taught America that black people too can play golf, which is not nothing, but um, if I'm doing my right job right and I help a vet do her job right, we're trying to, uh, trying to teach Americans, black Americans and white Americans, how to govern in a way that's in accordance to justice, in accordance with justice. So, like, I don't know whose contribution is going to be better to these United States. Like I said, I suspect my daughters are going to be healthier, like, in if not in mind, uh, if not in body, then in mind, then Tiger Woods' ch uh, children. So, like, I don't, I don't know whose contribution is bigger. I don't know who's, who's having a better life, but I feel like I'm winning this life uh, relative to him. And this goes on to the notion that we have to redefine what success looks like in America. Success might not be, um, success might not look like PGA championships and Masters green vests. It might look like being able to wear your United States colors on Memorial Day while you're doing a YouTube show to uh, talk about black politics, knowing that like you have your one marriage, you have a good job, you have a house, and you, have, and you get to see your kids and raise your kids and like hang out with your kids on Memorial Day. I don't think Tiger Woods got to do all of those things. Well, he's definitely not doing all of those tonight. And all the people who emulate Tiger Woods, who want to be Tiger Woods, you have to take the entire package when you think about what do you want to be and what kind of person you want to be and what kind of father do you want to be and what do we want our children do, to be? Do we want our children to be Tiger Woods? Or, I don't know, do you want your children to be me? It's a bit of a question. I just, I like where I'm sitting right now and this is also a bigger argument for uh, um, why we need to actually think seriously about what success means, what success looks like, what wisdom looks like. And honestly, you got to look at, we talk about Tiger Woods' father being this excellent father who, who, who figured out how to raise a, a, a golf prodigy by working with him on the links um, uh, since he was two years old and, and got him on, on, on Johnny Carson or whoever, Ed Sullivan, whoever, when he was three years old. But is that what success looks like when your son's kind of a wreck right now at 40 years old. Is that the kind of functional black adults we want to raise and call successful? Um, although he was very good at golf, he might be failing at life in a profound way that, like, I don't know. Uh, we just have to take seriously when we look at our role models and look at, like, the totality of their lives. Success looks like doing good things in your community, doing good things by your family, um, doing good things for the struggles of this country, which include getting justice for black people. So I want you to think about that, and I'm sure YouTube has a lot to say. Um, uh, about it. And um, yeah, so yeah, Tiger Woods and I have a lot in common, and uh, I think, I think, 
think maybe I'm winning. So let's talk about the kind of politics that will get us the justice we need in, in these United States. Let me turn this off. So I had a wonderful interview with Nathan Connolly, um, who is a professor at Johns Hopkins University. And Johns Hopkins University is in Baltimore, Maryland. And Nathan Hopkins studies the history of property um, in black America and how property is kind of informed how we think about our rights and the rights to be defended. Um, and how we defend our rights and, uh, and how capitalism works in the black imagination. So I'm going to play this interview. And while you watch this interview, I want you to think about how peculiar property rights are. Because not all rights have the shape of property rights. Property rights can actually be defended by guns, right? But like, you could, you could chase someone off your property with a gun. You can't really win healthcare with a gun in the same way. You can't really win um, um, employment discrimination with a gun, at the barrel of a gun. You can't force someone to hire you and treat you well at the barrel of a gun. Although there was that movie, was it, I think, help me out YouTube. Denzel Washington was in a movie about 10 years ago. Um, Denzel Washington was in a movie about 10 years ago where he held up a hospital trying to win healthcare for his kids, YouTube. Um, uh, when, when was that, John Q, John Q? Anyway, uh, yeah, it was, it was something like that. Um, so, like, he, there, 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 you saw a fictionalized person, uh, a fictionalized story about someone trying to win health care over the barrel of a gun. But when you watch this video, think of, the gun, think of the rights that black people were fighting for, their property rights, and then think of the rights that we can't get with violence in an easy way. Once again, this is a video um, I did with Nathan Connolly a professor at Johns Hopkins. He's wonderful. Check out his work, and I'll talk about him a little bit more at the end of this video. Take care. We don't need government. And this expert is uh, Dr. Nathan Connolly. Dr. Nathan, uh, say hello what's to up? the people. Hey, what's up, man? All right. So how did we go from property to super capitalists? So I think the first thing to keep in mind is that you have a very clear and long tradition of black people being very suspicious of the state. And I think it's okay. important to keep in mind that the state was seen for much of the country's history as the arm of white supremacy. Um, it was in many instances true that the state simply was white people, um, mm -hmm. that you know, the kind of traditions of popular sovereignty were very clear that whites di dictated what the state's response would be to black communities, to black ownership, to black forms of political self-determination. And so the need to grapple with the possibilities offered by property were seen as a very common sense response to the fact that after the mass disenfranchisement of black folk, especially in the late 19th century, property was the best thing that was available to people. Like the constitution was very ironclad about property rights. It was not giving voting as a positive right. It did not offer civil rights to African-Americans in any broad sense. The 14th amendment was defined in increasingly narrow terms. And so property and gun rights, effectively, were the two strongest bases for black claims for equality and citizenship. So what, what you have, and this isn't just you know, restricted to someone like Booker T. Washington, this is a broad sentiment among African Americans, is the mass effort to find and secure citizenship by way of property. And in fact, it's a lesser known truth that the high watermark of black ownership was in fact 1920, the 1920 census yes. was the highest, I'm so sorry? Yes, Black Wall Street. People talk. That's right, People tell right. stories. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. The, the, the high watermark of black owner, ownership is 1920, and then, of course, it's decimated through the financial collapse of the economy more, more broadly, but also through very pointed attacks on black ownership. And in an age when there wasn't cloud computing, in an age when there were, were very easy, easily ways to forge documents, simply attacking black banks, black homes, burning financial records was a very effective way to, in fact transfer property from black to white hands. And so there's a deep kind of anti-statism. However, however, during the 1930s and the 1940s, in large part through a variety of programs that were developed in concert with black elites at the local level in the South and parts North, the federal government begins to get modestly accountable and responsive to <laughs> the campaign, right? Modestly. Uh, 
Mod modestly, modestly. And so you have the development of what's called the kind of black cabinet through you know, Roosevelt's White House. And there's a very kind of slow attempt to rely on people like Robert Weaver, who worked in the Department of Interior, to rely on people like Charles Abrams, another African-American housing person, to try to introduce some form of federal protections to African-Americans in a way that really wasn't the case in the late 19th century and certainly wasn't the case after Woodrow Wilson in 1913 basically mass demoted all black people who worked in the federal government, right? Yeah. And, and, and so there was a very kind of slow and painstaking effort to try to expand government responsiveness to black needs, to use government programs to expand possibly, possibly black ownership. Many people you know, know the story about redlining in America, but don't recognize that the FHA was in some cases and in some contexts responsive to black demands for ownership and trying on a segregated basis to provide slices of ownership for African-Americans in Chicago and other parts of the urban South and elsewhere. And so there's a growing effort through the 40s and the 50s and obviously in the high watermark of the civil rights movement in the 1960s to keep the government accountable and increasingly accountable to black demands and black needs. But it's really important to keep in mind that the era between the 1930s and really the early 1970s is kind of the long exception to oh, okay. a broader kind of gilded age politics that is in the 19th century and then again in the late 20th century, right? Um, but in both of those instances, you see kind of, you know, the effort to argue that you don't need the government to expand, you know, black options for self-determination, that you don't need government contracts, you don't need regulation, you don't need to kind of, you know, rein in different forms of predation. And instead you can simply rely on the kind of free market to do what it's supposed to do. But it's, but it's also important that this is not a 1970s kind of new thing. This is baked into liberalism from its inception, right? The wow. idea of, absolutely, absolutely, that the market is going to secure what you need as an owner. If you live in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1895 and your name is Booker T. Washington, or if you're living in Georgia and your name is W.E.B. Du Bois, and you're trying to figure out how to get cooperatives to basically, again, secure black self-determination. There's a long history of people looking to the market to do the social work that can't be done in the political realm, either through disenfranchisement in the earlier period or simply through a general kind of abdication of the formal political process, as was argued in many cases in the late part of the 20th century. Good. So uh, to be clear, um... Our constitution and our culture was very good about supporting property rights, property Absolutely. rights. And so black people grafted on to property rights because those were the kinds and qualities of rights that um, were being secured by our government, at least our white counterparts and at sometimes um, black people and our gun rights. Uh, so Absolutely. we grafted on to that as a, as a cultural framework that we can't secure our, our political franchi franchisement, but we can secure our property and we can secure our guns against the predations of, of white people. However, and I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned, um, you mentioned Woodrow Wilson because in a lot of white progressive, in a lot of white people's minds, he was a progressive president who strengthened government intervention, but it was a racialized intervention that um, strengthened the power of white people to use government to make market adjustments and market interventions in support of white capital, right? Absolutely. I mean, people, people oftentimes overlook the fact, or at least refuse to point out the fact, that Woodrow Wilson was first and foremost a historian, right? He got his degree at Johns Hopkins University. Oh. Um, absolutely. And, and, and he wrote on the kind of failed experiment of reconstruction. He was very much of the belief that black people were incapable of self-government and of self-determination. And so Wilson's domestic policy relative to, again, like basically mass demoting an entire black middle class in Washington, D.C. in 1913. And then again, shortly thereafter, occupying the sovereign nation of Haiti and basically arguing there as well that black people in the Caribbean were not suitable for self-determination, taking over the banks in the island, imposing uh, labor conscriptions. I mean, it, it was a pretty brutal regime, all driven by a pretty old time notion that black people, if you gave them any modicum of political power, they were simply going to squander it. Right. But it was um, good government for white people, though. Right. For the white working classes. Absolutely. And, and also, just to add kind of a continuity point to this, the person who wrote unilaterally the Haitian Constitution was the assistant secretary of the Navy, who was no other than, wait for it, 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. so, and, and so, right? And so, and so, it was not uncommon for Republicans in the early 1930s to actually point out the fact that Franklin Roosevelt's record on black self determination was sketchy at best. Was sketchy at best. Um, but but I do want to point out one other thing that that you that you pointed to relative to property and pro- property really as a contract with the government because that's really how you make this connection between 19th century kind of classical liberal, uh, liberalism and what some people now are elected to call neoliberalism and, I, and I'm of a minority view I'll be honest with you irony I, I actually don't ascribe to neoliberalism as a framework because to my mind there's nothing really neo about it right okay. if you look at the long history of black folks engaging with liberalism it has always been the case that they were suffering you know excessive policing relative to how the market works right it was always the case that they were not getting services for the tax dollars that they in fact paid. Um, it's certainly the case that market logics were used to somehow justify how social goods were going to be handed out, even if that market was actually a white market. Mm-hmm. And in fact, many African Americans would argue, this is Robert Weaver and many others, for a freer free market because Jim Crow was in fact a form of regulation. It dictated what the goods and services would be along specific racial lines. And so the only argument one could make in the early to mid part of the 20th century was a deregulatory argument that you had to deregulate Jim Crow to somehow let the market actually do its good work, right? So it's an actual a cornerstone of civil rights activism to believe that the market, if left unfettered, will simply give out goods and services accordingly. But relative to the contract question, you know, many African Americans who own property, they also pay property taxes. And it's, it's actually well documented at this point that African Americans were using their property tax receipts as kind of freedom papers that they would use to then secure other kinds of infrastructural and political and social investments. So you could not justify not having a black beach if African Americans could prove that they had paid into the community chest by way of their taxes to get access to some kind of beachfront real estate. The reason that you got Jim Crow schools, colored only schools came actually through painstaking negotiations from black property owners bringing proof of having paid property taxes that they in fact were entitled to education again with policing the first black police forces across the south were only gained through black property owners marshalling the actual physical tax receipts that they collected <laughs> year after year and slamming them on the table in front of whites and saying look you're policing us with white cops who are brutalizing us on the streets we actually need black cops and we've paid for black cops accordingly And so there's a fascinating kind of lesser known history of these kinds of transactional politics by way of property ownership to try to make the liberal state actually be responsive to the very entitlements that black folks have already effectively paid for. Right. Okay. Okay. So when, okay, so if we get property rights and we can force our property rights or at least make, demonstrate um, like political, uh, the demonstrate the claim that the state should be responsive to us because of our property rights. How is that not enough? How is it not working for us? (laughs) If everyone gets all the rights and we get property rights, is that like, is it sufficient or what's going on? Yes, I think think that's certainly part of it. I mean, see the problem, one of the things that we oftentimes forget, right, is that many, many people recognize the fact that black pursuits of property are in and of themselves phenomenal um, indicators of the possibility of new markets and of other kinds of profits that can be gained. So, you know, it, it's, it's actually true that many speculators in the rural South of the late 19th and early 20th century, certainly in the development of urban migrations in the mid 19, I'm sorry, in the mid uh, 20th century, and again in the late 20th century, whenever you see black people, who are aspiring for property, and when there are new government programs or even new kinds of investment that are opening up these possibilities, what you have are new forms of predation that are themselves not regulated, right? So we regulate movement by way of Jim Crow, or we regulate housing quality by way of the Federal Housing Administration, or we regulate the location of public housing projects by way of the Housing and Urban Development Office, but we don't regulate the fact that if you look at what happened in the era of redlining, or even after they they made loans more available, it was constantly about trying to basically force black people into a very constricted range of choices. And once those ranges of choices are narrow, then you can force black folk to take all kinds of uh, subprime mortgages, 
subpar properties. You force them into segregation situations where you can actually gouge them and charge them more for less, right? So it's the creation of niche markets during the New Deal, during the 1950s post-war period, certainly during the 1970s as the FHA loans became more available. You know, 40% of HUD's budget in the early 1970s simply went toward paying the interest payments to lenders who simply dared to venture into the risky market of like urban housing, right? 40% of the budget just went straight to the banks for servicing the loans. And so again, it's like we have no real way of having a consistent conversation about the fact that black poverty is profitable. Black aspirations right. are profitable. Um, and that we have to be able to protect black folk from being preyed upon through, again, stricter regulations of things like tax liens, of you know, slum profiteering, of you know, overcharging for durable goods and, you know, uh, merchants uh, uh, in, in kind of commercial spaces in black neighborhoods, all of these ways in which, you know, capital finds a very attractive market um, in and, and, and through segregation, man. Wherever, you know, two or more Negroes are gathered, man, therein lies a market. And it, it's, it's just that, <laughs> it's that simple, sadly. Um, and, and it's and, not and, a market. It's a, it's a space for exploitation is what you're telling me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and there are ways in which once you get a, a lobbyist together, be it through the National Association of Real Estate Boards, whether it be through, um, you know, kind of various slumlord lobbying groups at the local level, certainly like payday lenders. You've got, you know, again, merchants, they all form these small cartels or lobbying groups that control price. They basically control supply and demand and they find ways to basically ex exploit people, man. You know, in, in Baltimore, we had this massive riot in you know, the unrest around Freddie Gray. Uh, a couple years ago, right? And, and the riot actually emerges at the Mondaman Mall, this you know shopping mall. And you would think it's kind of strange that a shopping mall as a kind of benign commercial space would be the place where this riot would actually pop. But you go into the mall and you look at what the stock of goods are there. It's poor quality, poor selection, high prices. I went there to actually just buy shoes on, on a lark. And you have to actually haggle for shoes in the mall like you're shopping in some like, roadside market like, you know, in a cross somewhere or in like, you know, some other country that would not regulate <laughs> by like <laughs> by like general, you know, um, you know, kind of mall mall practices. Right. And so, you know, this this is what black folk have to deal with, man. They have to deal with, you know, the kind of um, what's the word, the, the, the constancy of a moving target, whether you're talking about price or quality or, you know, general public safety. So these same organs that are supposed to that protect. Actually, I mean, Woodrow Wilson might be a microcosm, what you're talking about in macrocosm. These same organs protect white consumers from being exploited. But you're saying in black neighborhoods, they actually have been suborned by lobbyists to exploit black consumers. The same Absolutely. agency. The same right. agency. Absolutely, because, you know, th and this is actually a, a very important piece of the conversation, right, is that the federal government, and this is, again, it's, this is one of the reasons why there's a very long and well-developed kind of strain of anti-statism within, within black circles. Right. You know, the federal government has been very good at protecting white interests historically, right? And many black entrepreneurs, they understand this, and they believe that the only way in which, you know, you can actually be safe, obviously, is to step away from these formal state functions or, or formal state agencies in some cases. Again, it's not, it's not always true because, because frankly, you know, these agencies are also important for providing a whole host of safeguards and services. But the reality is that if you look at how the housing market was constructed, and it was indeed constructed in the 20th century in a way that the slave market of the 19th century was constructed, yeah. right? Yeah. It was about basically accounting for white housing preferences above all else. So property values, whether or not a place would be considered you know, appealing to your general suburban buyer, whether or not you put a kind of sewage processing plant, again, the quality of, of public housing or rental housing, all of this was determined in relation to a kind of general white buyer. And the documents on this are very clear. The Federal Housing Administration records, all these records are very clear on this. Even as you went into the late 20th century and you started having conversations about busing, or there were conversations about you know, the location of new urbanism or gentrification, there's a general sense, right, that the white consumer is the default consumer. Mm -hmm. In a neighborhood that might be considered creepy because it has like white meth addicts in it, but can still get like robust housing programs or first time buyer programs, um, you know, it's still considered to be a place where it's necessary and possible to have economic development that won't mass displace residents, as opposed to concentrated black neighborhoods 
that are considered to be like scary and have like vacant housing problems that again are fomented by landlords, not by tenants, uh, right? Uh, They're fomented by zoning and by like broken windows policing, not by the residents themselves. I mean, all of this is kind of taken to be, well, that's for black folk to experience and deal with. And therefore we're just going to basically sit on vacant properties for five, six, seven years, right? Wait for the property values to basically be where we need them, whether it's to drop for the sake of mass buying or to increase for the sake of mass selling. And we're not gonna worry too much about the people who are in the neighborhood who might actually be trying to eke out a day-to-day -day existence. And that really is the North Star for the American housing economy, which is like, where exactly are white preferences located relative to the yoga cafe, relative to the meth clinic, relative to these and other- And you're saying this has been the case ever since the, the, the housing market was constructed onto today. The white buyer is the buyer that sets the norm for the FHA's priorities. Absolutely, and, and, and not just the FHA, but for like, you know, local zoning boards, for, you know, urban development projects coming from pri the private sector, right? There, there's a sense that the, the kind of, I mean, you've seen this, for instance, in like, you know, Southern California, or obviously in Brooklyn, right? All these places that are now being gentrified, they end up changing the name, they end up changing the kind of the zoning, you know, issues. They, and, and in some cases, they're much more strict after there's white interest about whether or not you can have zoning variances that would allow for landlords to come in and speculate. I mean, there's all these ways in which city governments, man, are and, and, and state governments for that matter, and federal governments are very good at determining which areas are going to experience downward mobility and which areas are going to experience a kind of rise in property values, right? And, and it's important because, you know, we don't really understand how when you look at something like eminent domain, which is something I've, I've researched a fair amount, you know, eminent domain is when you have the government taking private land for the apparent public good, right? Now, what this does is that, again, it's, this is the market kind of doing its work, right? But the federal government and, and the local government can determine whether or not you get building permits, whether or not you actually keep the streets paid, whether or not there's street lights. And there are actually documented cases of people in black communities in the Jim Crow era who were intentionally targeted for no building permits, no updates, no infrastructure, so that property values would then fall, allow city governments to buy those same neighborhoods en masse at a discount, and then mass displace those communities, oftentimes in one fell swoop, with like the police department knocking on the door and kicking people out on the street, right? Oh, so where did that happen? So this happened in, in a variety of different cities. The area that I wrote about in some detail is a suburban area just outside of Miami called Railroad Shop. And in 1947, you had about 80 families, 80 black families in total, thrown out um, pretty abruptly by the Miami Police Department. And the purpose was to build a kind of whites only school and a whites only firehouse because the state law and, and again, and, and the law as outlined in the constitution so that you cannot take private land unless it's for an ostensible public good, right? So it had to be some kind of government funded infrastructure. Now the school that they built, which was the Andrew Jackson School, ironically enough, was left empty for five years. Nobody used it. The firehouse was, was, was totally defunct, but it was that served as enough public infrastructure to displace a community that then made sure that the neighboring white community could have its property values protected. And, and you're seeing this now yet again in the, the early 21st century around new Supreme Court laws that in 2005 made it possible for corporations to now be the kind of chief engine of these redevelopment initiatives, right? right. You let zoning decline, you make it difficult for communities to get permits, and then all of a sudden you have the, the, the property values fall to the point where you can buy massive numbers of blocks at one time and then create a target, right? Or some kind of big box retailer okay. to then push people out in mass, right? And so again, the folks who have been there for years, the folks who have been invested, maybe had ownership in those neighborhoods for years, they're certainly not getting fair market value because the black families who have been there since, you know, 50 years ago are having their property values falsely depressed to make the condemnation costs cheaper ah, for the city ah, and state yeah. governments that are doing the eminent, eminent domain work. Yeah. All right. So I have one more, one more issue that you touched on before I let you go. Um, sure. You said that it's easy to align white interests with government interests, but there are times when it's almost irresponsible to ignore black political power and our ability to make government work for us in critical ways. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I mean, so, you know, obviously there's a moment that we're in right now. And, you know, there there were certainly, you know, moments in the 1980s and 1990s where people, and really in the 1970s, when African-Americans tried to take over the levers of local power, certainly take over the levers of city governments. You know, I know you're a big fan of Marion Barry, right, yeah. who's trying to give government contracts yeah. yes. to African-Americans. Um, and that certainly is a case where you can generate public spending that helps to drive kind of economic growth. Right? And it's certainly the case that historically that's been the case for, you know, white capitalists who have been getting really cushy government contracts <laughs> for a very long time. Yeah. Um, but but I, I think it's also important to keep in mind that, you know, we don't have in many corners of, you know, kind of Afro-America enough of a kind of, you know, critical mass of, you know, one, you know, black kind of, you know, coalitions um, to take over state houses in the way that, you know, the American Legislative Exchange Council did right. uh, across the country, right, through basically like writing these templates of state, you know, legislation documents and sending them around the country to get the state laws to do what they want. Um, I think that has to actually be part of the movement going forward. And, you know, you have people like Reverend Barber who are moving in this direction, certainly in, in North Carolina, but, you know, it, it's going to require a state takeover of, you know, black interests, certainly, but even just more responsible kind of anti-poverty measures. Um, I think it's, it's also going to require, honestly, being honest about suburban poverty, man. You know, there was a whole there was a whole side of the kind of you know property owning wing of Afro America again going back into the mid twentieth century that believed that suburbia was going to save Afro America, right? If you simply move to the suburbs, you're going to be okay. <laughs> um, and you know, the, since two thousand and five, most poor people have lived in the suburbs in this country, right? We we don't have a, a language. We're talking about suburban poverty, even though you, we've got, you know, stories I think about Ferguson shed some light on that, actually. It's, it certainly did. It certainly did. As it, but, but again, you know, it took Ferguson when we had like a, a library of, you know, popular culture referencing South Central California. Right. As another example, whether N.W.A. or John Singleton yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. Right? We should have known better. We should have known better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. So, Nate, before I let you go, tell them who you are and where they can find more information. And tell them when this book is dropping. Well, so, okay, the, 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 the book that I, I first wrote where I talk about the displacements and around housing specifically is already out. That's called The World More Concrete, Real Estate and the Remaking of Jim Crow South Florida. And you can find that, you know, wherever you can buy books. Now I'm working on black capitalism and I'm working on a family history that deals very much with these issues that moves across the Americas from the Caribbean to North America. And both of those projects are in early, early stage. So it's probably going to be a few years before you can cop those. Um, I am uh, on faculty at Johns Hopkins University, um, and so you know I, I offer classes there. But I'm also a co-host on the public radio podcast Backstory, which airs every Friday. Um, it's sponsored by the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and a number of other foundations. And there we do a, a really good job actually talking about you know various forms of news making that we see in contemporary kind of you know commentary, but in the long view. And I do a lot there with racism and poverty, certainly. So you can check us out there as well. All right. Backstory on NPR. And they can just go to iTunes and put in Backstory and it'll come up. It's right there. You can subscribe to the podcast. All right. Perfect. Thank you. And I uh, hope to see you again. All right. Thanks, Army. So that was my interview with uh, Nathan Conley. That was my interview with Nathan Conley. And he mentioned, he went over a few points. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to rehearse a few arguments right now. And we're going to talk about it. And hopefully we can talk about it uh, with callers who call in in about a half hour. He said that um, property rights were our most secure rights. And so while you can talk about a right to an equal education, while you can talk about healthcare rights, and while you can talk about you know, a right to equal employment, uh, property rights were our most constitutionally secure, and we could actually defend them with the second most secure right, <laughs> like the right to bear arms. So I, this is important for Memorial Day because, like I said before, the, the, uh, I played the interview for those who came in late. A lot of black vets came home and became fantastic civil rights leaders um, and they did so with arms because a lot of white vets came home and became awful Klansmen and awful um, white public leaders who tried to disenfranchise and disembody black people. Um, and uh, so I wear these colors today for the black civil rights for the black military leaders who came home and unfortunately had to use some of that martial knowledge to defend black people here in these United States. And Robert F. Williams, Medgar Evers, and like I said, Harriet Tubman. 
they would all count in that number, but the number goes on and on and on. Um, so you had white vets coming home and being awful and black vets coming home and standing up for our communities. And so thank you to the families of those black vets who did stand up. Um, this is for you. So property rights were the most constitutionally secure rights um, because we could actually produce paper, a tax receipt or a deed uh, to show that we own this land and you can defend land through possession with a gun. Um, the problem is when everyone else in America has access to all of those other rights and access to the levers of, of, of political power, which means they get universities, land grant universities that just admit their students. They get jobs and public contracts so they can exercise a kind of social freedom and social rights that aren't enumerated in the Constitution, but that we do consider rights at the statutory level, um, but are harder to defend. They have legal care. Um, they can go to, a, they have access to lawyers. So yes, you can defend your property, but if someone tries to take your property and you don't have a gun to chase them off that property, or you'd rather not chase them off that property after the barrel of a gun, you'd rather use a lawyer, but you can't accept a lawyer, or you can't um, pay for a lawyer, then do you really have rights? Can you really defend those property rights? And he was talking about in a time before, um, you know, cloud computing, when property rights were held, um, when the, the vouchsafe and the proof of property rights were held at you know, your local bank, or documents could be forged or destroyed when your house was destroyed or your local bank was destroyed. Um, even property rights without other political protections was not sufficient, was not enough. So anyone who thinks, and black people, this is honest, this is truth, anyone who thinks that property rights alone will save black people if we don't have the other political rights that's just not the case. That's just not the case. Property rights have never been sufficient for freedom. It's one step on the road to freedom. Property rights without access to a lawyer to defend those property rights um, is not sufficient. And that's why black capitalism that depends on property rights alone as being sufficient will not be sufficient but a black politics that actually takes the other rights, the other rights that cannot be won merely by use of violence, but must be um, engaged politically. You know, right to get a government contract, right to be employed, right to end uh, housing segregation, right to, get to equal schooling. Rights always entail equal opportunity. This is important, a little bit of, I study political philosophy, I study freedom and alienation, but this is a little bit of political philosophy. When people ask you what are rights, it's important to know that rights are just externalized bits of freedom and they always entail equal opportunity because if your rights are not a matter of equal opportunity, that means they're just someone else's privileges. That means if you have right a right um, but not equal opportunity to defend it in court, it's not really a right. It's just someone else, that, the person with the access to a lawyer, it's that person's privilege, right? They call them rights, but if you can't defend your rights in courts, they're not rights, they're just someone else's privilege. Rights entail equal opportunity, which means it's not just a purview of some, some people's. This is why I like marriage rights, for example. If you don't have the, if you, if you can't get married, then it's not a right, it's just a privilege of a certain class. For example, that class used to be people of the same ethnicity now. Then it was people of the same, um, uh, or people of uh, different genders. And now it's, 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 a, it's a same sex. Um, um, the sphere of equality has, has opened up, so now it's people of the same gender can also get married to make it a right, not just a privilege of a certain set. So don't tell anyone that you, don't let anyone tell you that you have a right, but that you can't exercise your right. Because if you can't exercise your right, it's not really a right, it's someone else's con, it's someone else's privilege. Now, there's a billionaire, Peter Thiel, out in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Northern California, who was one of the founders of PayPal. 
He actually helped out Hulk Hogan in a lawsuit because Hulk Hogan is just one of those meager, as he called them, single-digit millionaires. And Peter Thiel says, he's, Peter Thiel is a billionaire, he says, look, if you're just some single-digit uh, single millionaire, you don't really have the kind of legal access that means you, have, you, can, you really have rights. You're not even in the game. I could do whatever I want to you as a billionaire. So that's why I helped out um, uh, Hulk Hogan because Hulk Hogan was just some single digit millionaire who needed real legal help to fight the fight he needed to fight. So I, I needed to give him like some money so he can get real legal care. So this is a billionaire telling you that single digit millionaires aren't really in the game. So black people, if single digit millionaires don't have rights, do you think we have rights? If someone tries to eminent domain you out of your house, uh, do you think you have, you have the access to a lawyer and the, the, the legal, <laughs> the access to a lawyer to actually defend those rights? And if you can't defend those rights, are they really rights? If someone like treats you bad at work, can you really actually, and you're not unionized, that means the union would have a lawyer uh, for you. But if you're in, in a non-union shop and someone treats you poorly at work, if you can't afford a lawyer, do you really have rights? Do you really have a right to equal opportunity in employment? Like, if you can't sue, if you don't have those rights covered by a lawyer, then you don't have rights. And that's why there's a guy running in the, or putting together a bid in the 10th district in Georgia. His name is uh, Richard Winfield. He's putting together a bid, and one of his platforms is going to be like, look, if you don't have access to legal care as a right, not just a legal aid model where it's like charity, some lawyer doing pro bono work, but actually as a right to a good lawyer who's going to stick with you through the case. Let me get my colors right as I say this. If you uh, don't have access to a good lawyer, then you don't really have rights. So part of what it is to be a citizen is to have access to a lawyer. And so we should think of the right to legal care just like we think of the right to health care. Just call it legal insurance. And we should have single payer legal care, which means you go and pay $5 to any lawyer in your network and you get the lawyer. And without a copay even. He says without a copay. Um, and you just get access to a lawyer because if you don't have access to lawyer to a lawyer to actually contest those rights, then you don't have rights. And it's just someone telling you a con, making you believe, making you believe that you have rights when you don't. So that's his argument for legal care on the model of single payer healthcare. And it's actually a, um, an argument I I actually agree with because if you can't defend your rights in court, then you really don't have rights. You're just someone else's patsy. So uh, you're just a victim of the system. So, um, so just the notion that property rights are sufficient. And also the notion that while it's easy to identify the government with white people in the United States, black people have always been able to exercise when or have had moments when they've been able to exercise political power when they get their black politics right. When we get our black politics right, we can shape, um, we can exercise a political power. They say that majorities don't create politics, but rather politics creates majorities. So if we can get our politics right, and that includes a media, um, then I think we can create enough of a local and then eventually a state majority to, to, get, the politics, uh, to get the policies we need to um, get what we're owed for being Americans. Um, and so that's going to take a black politics. It's going to take a media that's independent of, 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 of white capital, or at least that's not controlled by white capital. And uh, that's why, you know, I produce this show for a vet every Monday and Wednesday. That's the step in that direction. I also do some local work uh, here in Athens, Georgia, that, that is moving in that direction. So it's really easy to identify black, or it's really easy to identify U.S. government power with the white identity. But don't let them take our colors away from us. Don't let them take our United States away from us. Black politics does mean something. And black politics has meant something in the United States. And it has shaped policies in the United States when we haven't gotten spun. And I say from the 90s on, pretty much since 
Jesse Jackson lost in 88, but definitely since 92 and Clinton on, we've been spun. We've been spun by, in the media, it's been by Oprah and by Shonda Rhimes and by a whole lot of other people who've made black people too ashamed to make claims as black people um, for what we're owed as black people. You know, you need guys, actually, you need guys like me writing, let me write good times. <laughs> let me write good times. Forget, uh, oh, Sanford and Son, but good times. Let me write good times. I'll put it in Chicago. I'll make Michael, um, yeah, that'd be awesome if they let me write good times. I'd make Michael a laid off Chicago teacher who was fired from school closings, um, put him in the south side of Chicago and like, Build it around that. And that would be a black show about black politics. And like, actually, and another, another way, another show, if you are a king of the media world, you should let me write the next Dick Wolf Chicago show. So you have your Chicago um, uh, justice and you have your Chicago PD and your Chicago med. Let me write Chicago labor. <laughs> well, it's about black labor organizers, plumbers trying to get contracts in, in, in Chicago or teachers trying to get their jobs back in Chicago. Like that would be the kind of black media that would actually remind black people that one, you're black, two, that means something, three, these United States owes you something and the way to get it isn't through individual striving, which is like where the, where the ideal is an escape. And when escape looks like, honestly, I'll tie this back to Tiger Woods, when escape looks like escaping to, um, you know, a $700 million net worth with when you're at a barbecue and you're drunk and your friends don't call you an uber and that means you don't really have friends when escape looks like like a life without friends and a life without a community without a black community then that's not success that's not success so we need a black politics for real black success i want my daughters to go to a school with black people and i want my daughters to like be able to date black people with money so it's not just about individual striving uh, or at least have the choice to date black people like from solid middle class incomes. So it's not just can't, black success can't just be about individual escape. And what Nathan Colony, uh, uh, Nathan, Dr. Uh, Colony um, argued is that actually suburban poverty, where they actually don't have the infrastructure for poverty, is what the new face of poverty and even black poverty is going to look like. So just escaping to the suburbs is not, going to, um, is not going to save us. What we need is a politics that actually takes our situation where we are at seriously and builds the communities where we're at and get contractors and jobs in those communities where we are. So um, property rights can't be our only rights. And that means a capitalism that depends on property rights and the market to to defend uh, us will not be enough, will never be enough. It wasn't even enough when like, we had Black Wall Street um, because, you know, they burned it down and then we didn't have the legal representation to get a restitution because, because property rights can't be the only rights and we need like a whole politics that would have gotten restitution for the families of Black Wall Street or families of lynching victims or uh, would put like the accuser of Emmett Till in jail. So we need to, because uh, you know, sometimes justice looks like putting her in jail. By the way, it came out a few months ago, if you don't know, Emmett Till, the, acu the, one who, the woman who accused Emmett Till of whistling at her that ended up with Emmett Till dying, she made the whole thing up. Like in a well-ordered world, she should be facing charges. I don't care how old she is. Although he shouldn't have died just for whatever he didn't do, but like she should be facing charges for inciting a riot. Um, so I'm about to open up these phone lines. We'll talk, we'll talk, oh, I should talk about Tommy Curry's interview. I should talk about Tommy Curry. Dr. Tommy Curry is one of my friends. I'm honored to actually call uh, Curry, Dr. Curry one of my friends. Um, let me make sure. Yeah, I'm honored to call um, Dr. Tyra Curry, one of my friends. We were on a panel a few uh, months ago. And, uh, you know, I did his conference, uh, Philosophy Born of Struggle, um, 
a few months before that. And he got in trouble. You could say he got in trouble, but really he was a victim of harassment and continues to be the victim of harassment because in an interview he gave, Dr. Tommy Curry is a philosophy professor at uh, Texas A&M. He studies um, the violence the state does to black men and boys and the violence that has been perpetrated on the bodies of black men and boys uh, for all of these United States and where that violence comes from, whether it comes from cops, whether it comes from white women, whether it comes from white men. Uh, so Dr. T Curry was on, was giving an interview saying that like, look, if you look at the history of black resistance to oppression throughout all of American history, like it's included guns. And, you know, when we've won, sometimes it includes white people have to die. So if we're actually talking about an equality going forward, that in, like, we can't rule out the notion that before we get this equality, it may be the case that some white people have to die. If reparations are going to happen, you know, it's going to tick off some white landowners, and white landowners like their guns. So they may, like, I don't know how this goes out. Like, it may be the case. This is my extrapolating from um, Curry's argument. But Curry just said, like, look, if we're going to actually push for equality, in the hi if you look at the history of black struggles for equality, it may be the case that white people may have to die. And I think that's actually a fair argument. We asked, we asked to get let loose from chains, but um, they didn't do it. It took a few white people dying for us to be at least out of bondage. I'm not convinced we're free yet, but we're out of, out of that kind of chattel bondage. Um, so just giving that argument in a, an interview was picked up from a right-wing blog, and then like it got back to some Texas A&M donors or whatever who put pressure on the university president, a guy named Young. And then Young ran out this, wrote this horrible letter that was atrocious and like, this means that Young doesn't know his job as a president of a major university. Or maybe he knows his job as an as an as a instrument of white supremacy. Who and then Young wrote this letter saying that like he found Curry's comments disturbing and against Texas A and M's core values. And remember, Texas A and M is one of these Southern schools that has a history of anti black racist violence and like and um, anti-black racist incidents and like just has been proud of its white supremacist institutions for, uh, um, you know, as long as it's been around in Texas. So let's not pretend that part of Texas A&M's core values doesn't include white supremacy or at least anti-black racism. So um, the president of Texas A&M wrote this letter to the student body and like, it went uh, nationwide that said he was disturbed by uh, Professor Curry's um, comments that like, look, if we're looking for equality in America, it may be the case that white people have to die because like when we've struggled for equality up until now, it sometimes includes white people dying. Um, and honestly, I'll go one further. And this might, this is, <laughs> I'm glad Vet's not here because she might not want me to say this. Look, if people in Black Wall Street had had uh, some Gatling guns to mow some of those people, some of those interlopers down, then maybe, maybe the world would be a better off uh, place. More white people had died instead of like allowing what, some 300 um, black families, 300 black businesses to, to, to go out in Black Wall Street. So, so Tom McCurry was making a historical argument and speculating about the future in a very responsible way, given the struggle of black liberation in the United States. And the university president felt comfortable just uh, throwing Professor Curry under the bus. And that's not right. So that's why I you know, want to take time to make his argument again on this show and say, one, Tom McCurry's coming out with a book, The Man Not. Um, and I think it drops in a few months. I've already pre-ordered a copy. It's possible. It's so popular. You can't pre-order a copy anymore. But go to Amazon anyway and put in Tommy Curry um, and order your copy of The, the Man Not. The argument, and Tommy Curry, Tommy and I uh, talked about this over lunch. It's fascinating. He takes social dominance theory, which was the dominant um, paradigm.
paradigm for thinking about uh, colonial relationships and race relationships up until you know the mid '80s, and and he takes it and says like, look, it's still it's appropriate that when we look at gender relations, we really shouldn't just look at men versus women because if you look at the history of gender, the way gender works in imperialism, in colonialism, and in American subjugation, it's not men against women. It's white men versus native or black men. Like, that's the way imperialism works. You go somewhere and subjugate the men. That means either you kill them, or there's history of, like, male rapes and castration, because that's, that's the tension. It's between the men. And that's why you have actually so many women. That's why for a KKK, for every KKK, there's a WKKK of women who are, you know, sewing those little white hoods um, so that, uh, you know, their husbands can, can go out and, and lynch black people and subjugate black people. So the tension is between, and this is a gendered tension, it's between... Um, black men and white men, or white men and um, in imperialism, like any native man. And women are often like suborned in as auxiliaries in that conflict, right? So that's why the primary target, and like honestly, a lot of women are gonna give me like static when I say that gender in America is about the struggle between men, but like, the record's clear. Like, mass incarceration isn't a black woman problem. And I say that not because black women aren't incarcerated at levels much, much higher than um, black men. I mean, it's not that black women aren't incarcerated at levels much, much higher than white women. It's just that in the United States, we don't incarcerate women. Not at the rate that would call it mass incarceration that like makes it this like pressing political problem. We incarcerate so many black men that like it actually screws up employment numbers. Like we don't have data. Um, and insofar as it destabilizes the black family, it's because like you've like women now who aren't incarcerated have to take up more of a burden because we've incarcerated black men. So like the the primary racial tension and gender tension is actually between black men and white men. And honestly, I was talking to Yvette about this. She's, she's a little bit more pessimistic than I was. She said, well, then they've already won because like, black men aren't doing so well. If you look at the numbers, black men are not doing so well. Um, and there are all of these schemes to get especially heterosexual black men out of the picture, and justice for heterosexual black men out of the picture. And, and this happens on the left and the right. The left is a little bit more uh, cunning about it than the right is. Um, but the management of heterosexual black men as a strategy of dominance, as a strategy of, of white male supremacy, is, uh, is historically attested. It's just clear that anti, like racist policies in America primarily, not singularly, but primarily targeted black men and then like black women were sucked up in the, as collateral damage to the primary targets. Now, once you've wiped out black men, and depending on who you talk to, black men are wiped out, then they're going to go after black women. Um, but Tommy makes, in the, in the Man Not, his new book comes out, he makes a very, very persuasive uh, argument building on like data, like both contemporary data and um, and historical data that says, like, look, violence against black men is the target. That is the primary target. And we need to look at, one, white women as perpetrators as violence against black men and see it in all of its manifestations. Like, for example, cultural manifestations. How many, like, how much has the media fed this narrative of, 
of like black men as being like patriarchs or abusive. And when you look at the when you look at the data, black men are kind of awesome. One, we're more progressive than our white ca- counterparts. And people who think that like there's such a thing as black patriarchy doesn't uh, don't understand that one archy means rule. And when black men are jobless or in jail, like we're not ruling over anyone. You want to look at patriarchy? Go to like white communities. That's what real patriarchy is. Like they don't have songs on the radio called Call Tyrone to come kick your stuff up. Like that's, that's <laughs> like in white communities, that's what patriarchy is. There's no such thing as black patriarchy. And even though the, the, the numbers, if you dig into the numbers on violence, it's bi-directional, which means that like, it's just poor people fighting. And if you actually want to do something about domestic violence, and if you want to do something about violence in the black community, the variable is poverty, not color. Black men are awesome. We're great dads. Like, black men are great. And don't let anyone tell you anything different. If you want to do something about violence, look at um, poverty. And then if you, look, and if you actually want to like, think about why we've been structured this way, look at how violence occurs when it does occur in black households, it's bi-directional, which means that um, it's two people fighting. Someone scratched someone and then like a wife scratched her husband and the husband punched the wife. Like it's just not, it's even in that, even you remember, you remember the Ray Rice video uh, two years ago where like we was, that was supposed to like show the, 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 the horribleness of black men because he had this video of Ray Rice uh, punching his, his girlfriend. First of all, that punch, you should never punch women, like, at all. But one, it should, that video should tell you something about, like, football culture. And two, what they don't show in that video is, like, Ray Rice's girlfriend at the time, she scratched at him and then spat at him. Don't spit at people. One way I don't get punched in the world is that I don't go around spitting on people. Like I could say something hard about this is what happens when you don't grow up with men in your life and like then you just like don't know how to treat men and don't, don't you just go around spitting at people like Mike Tyson and then they punch you. Um, like, but like I don't spit at people so I don't get punched. So I'm not saying she deserved to be punched because nobody deserves to be punched, but also nobody deserves to be spat at. I teach my daughters, and I have daughters. Like, I teach my daughters don't spit at people. Um, and I, like, maybe he's violent when she's not scratching and spitting at him, but, like, in that scene, she spat at him. Like, what? Like, that's the problem. That's the problem. Like, a cultural decimation that allows it to be normalized that, like, people can scratch and spit at people. I've survived my marriage this long without scratching or spitting at my wife, and my, my wife hasn't scratched or spit at me. So, like, that's, like, those are the kinds of relationships we should, we should look to build and um, understand violence as, like, a deeper bi-directional, which means it happens both ways, men against women, women against men. Um, a deeper problem that has to do with like cultural decimation and poverty, not just black patriarchy. Black men are awesome. I imagine, don't take, now these words are my words, not events. I'm not looking at the YouTube comments right now and I, I suspect that they're not very uh, uh, flattering. But um, don't take my word for it. I mean, take this as my, as my opinion, not a vet's opinion. Don't blame a vet. A vet's awesome. We agree on many things. We may even agree on this. We may disagree on this. But like this, a vet's out of town. So like you're getting 100, um, 100% triple distilled, 300 proof irony on, in, in this video. So um, don't blame a vet. Still sign up for her newsletter. Go to breakingbrown.com. Tell your friends about Breaking Brown because when she's on, it's the best independent media um, out there talking about black people and black politics. And uh, when I'm on, it's not the best, but like, you know, it's up there. Uh, I try to bring something different when she's out of town. So we're about to open up phones once I get this number up. Um, And 
we'll take calls. Like I said, I'm not going to look at YouTube because uh, I suspect they're not saying, oh, but we do have full callers. We do have callers. No, some people love you. Oh, good. Some people, it turns out some people actually like me. I'm not sure. Uh, but remember, what I'm saying right now isn't about Yvette. Yvette's wonderful. <laughs> I have not run these arguments by her. I uh, did not tell her I was going to talk about this. Um, so uh, please come back. Let's go back. And uh, if you like what we're doing here at BreakingBrown.com, go to www.BreakingBrown.com. Sign up for her newsletter. And then go to the site on the right panel. Sign up for a monthly donation because like, we'd like to do more interviews. We'd like to get a vet out with the intern, Matthew, um, to do interviews on the fly. We'd like to, we'd, we'd like to grow a little bit and have, um, you know, to, to, to be more aggressive in our, our approach. And that's going to take a little bit of money. So um, <laughs> sign up for a monthly. That would be great if you did. And uh, I'm going to take calls. Once again, I'm not going to look at the comments because, you know, I don't need that in my life right now. Uh, let's hear the phones. Oh, hold on. And hello. Hello, you're on. Talk to me. Hello. Yes. Uh, this is Mr. Mr. Um, can hey. you hear me clearly? I can. What's up? Okay. Yes. How are you? Uh, this is uh, Baruti from Jacksonville. Oh, okay. Thanks for your time. I'm enjoying your show. If you'll just give me a, a second to ask your question, and as Mr. Carnell usually says, she needs to frame a question. Right. So, so, so do I, if I can put it in time today. Okay? Yeah, what's All up? All right. Um, since, since you have posited the notion that uh, we as black people need to properly organize and strategize and properly petition in the United States government for reparations due to slavery, Jim Crow, yes. mass incarceration, economic marginalization, and other atrocities against our race, what leverage do you foresee of having? And I ask this what? because what? there are no significant opportunities of white people in the United States, whether liberal or conservative, who support reparations for blacks. In fact, most are highly angered and annoyed by the notion. <laughs> and as Ms. Carnell, Ms. Antonio Moore, and you have mentioned before, uh, whites basically control, own, and gatekeep the vast amount of wealth in the country. So where is our tangible leverage to, to make them grant after American uh, demands for reparations? Okay. Malcolm X suggested that the U.S. be placed uh, or be taken to a UN court and charged with crimes against humanity as a pre-step in getting represent. However, if the U.S. only seems to aggressively step in or intervene for group represent when oppressed groups within a country want sovereignty as a country of their own, and blacks in the U.S. have not advocated for such. Okay. So I wanted to say that if you uh, go to C-SPAN and look up a program called Opposition, to uh, President Clinton's race initiative, 1997, uh, there's a group, an organization called uh, America's Self Determination, the national organization to discuss race and race problem solutions. The organization's spokesperson, Jeffrey Anderson, indicated that whites in general are opposed to slavery reparations, but would entertain the dissent of thought of financial arrangements to blacks if it were connected to a separate program agenda. Okay, so thank you. you. Could highlight that, I appreciate your time, and thanks for you letting me frame the question. You got it, you got it. And notice everyone playing at home, I let him finish his question. Look at that. I could have cut him off, but I didn't because I'm a classy Negro. So what? Um, so there are, a few, there are a few things going on here. We're going we're gonna to talk about separatism after I after I frame the answer. Right, so there are different kinds of power, right? There's, there are different kinds of power, the way power is exercised. There's political power, it's what we do when we organize. There's consumption, it's what we do when we boycott or spend our money in a certain way. And then there's production. Let me be clear. 
Real economic power is not in consumption. It's not in consumption. You're not going to change your consumption habits to get black people out of our situation. Black capitalists will say like, well, if we just change our consumption habits, um, like we could actually get in the game and just like keep the black dollar in the black community a little bit longer. No, that's not, that's like, that's not how it works. And notice how the people who tell you this will be either like bank, pre black bank presidents or like desperate black business owners. Um, but like who are just worried about their like little business because that's like changing consumption habits is not like changing consumption habits is not the way you grow power is not the way you exercise power because consumption is not real power consumption is not real power real power comes in production and we're in a capitalist economy without access to real investment capital. And real investment capital isn't a few hundred dollars to get a license. Real investment capital is 30K to get a business. If you can make a few phone calls to get 30K, 30K to lose because a lot of businesses go under, 30K to lose um, to start your business, then you're in the game. But black people, when our median net worth is $1,700, we're just not in that game. So like we have a black capitalist class that really wants us to convince us and we really want to believe that power is in consumption, but power is not for anybody. Power is not in consumption. Power is in production. And in a capitalist economy, production requires investment capital. Right? So don't, don't let people who make you feel bad for like going to the movies, spending $7 to go to the movies or buying a pair of Jordans or buying a weave, tell you that like you're screwing up the black economy. No, a bad black politics, and actually a bad white politics, but that's not buffered by a, a, bad, um, a good black politics, is screwing up the black economy. So real power is in production. Now how do we gain our production power? That's gonna be through politics. So, it's really tempting, and this is something Colony suggested before, it's really tempting to just identify the American government with white people. American government is white people. But that's just not the case. We can actually exercise political pressure when we do. We, black people, we decided who was going to be the Democratic nominee for president. Like, it was black people who chose Hillary Clinton. If Bernie Sanders had just split the South, and there are reasons Bernie Sanders didn't do that. Some of that's our black politics, our like, confused black politics. Other reason he didn't split the South is because like, we depend on media that wasn't working on our interests. And the media told us that Clinton, told a lot of black people that Clinton was the only viable candidate. Um, and, 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 and that happened. But like, to say that black people don't have political power and to say that the government is all white people ignores the strategic position of black people in these United States. Right now, the Democratic Party needs us. That's why they put so much money and time and energy getting black faces to get black people not to ask for anything. If we asked for anything, if we asked for reparations the way that the Jewish um, lobby, that means APAC and the Anti-Defamation League, that means they have a political league and a league that controls like their media, um, ask for support for Israel, we would have our reparations. We would have our reparations. But instead, since we don't control our media, um, we have been conned not to demand things and not to... Uh, um, the only boycott in America that matters isn't a money boycott, it's an electoral boycott. If we just stop voting for Democrats, they'll do what we want. But they put a lot of money, the Democratic Party puts a lot of money into getting Shonda Rhimes and Oprah uh, to, to guilt you in the voting. And since they know you're going to vote, you're not going to vote for Republicans, that means they're going to assume that you're going to vote Democrat. We need to say, no, we're not going to vote. We won't vote because our vote doesn't mean anything until you put our agenda on the table. And that's how we'll make our moves. I'm, trying, I'm doing that locally in Athens, and it's actually like it's changed the discourse here in Athens. And we could do this nationally if we get our media right and if we get our local politics right. And if we say, 
Look, Democrats. Look, Nancy Pelosi. Look, John Lewis. What, the, what are you doing? Sitting in for some gun bill that's not going to do anything, but you're not going to sit in for reparations? We're going to knock you out. We're not going to vote for John Lewis. We're not going to vote for Elijah Cummings. I don't want to hear about something you did 40 years ago standing up for um, uh, civil rights 40 years ago. What are you doing for me today? Or I'm going to get someone in there today who's actually going to stand up for justice for me. If we do that within the Democratic Party, we have just enough leverage to actually get our needs met. Trump got a wall. Trump got a wall on the platform. I don't know if he's going to get the wall built. He may or may not. But he got a wall on the platform. The uh, APAC and the Anti-Defamation League gets reparations for Israel. They get, they get a package for Israel. They get an arms deal for Israel. Like, we can get reparations on the Democratic platform. We got reparations on the uh, Democratic Socialists of, on, of America um, um, platform because they adopted the Movement for Black Lives platform and reparations is a cog in the Movement for Black Lives platform. So we just have to drill down and consolidate. If we get people talking about reparations the way they're talking about mass incarcerations, we've, we've won. We've gotten, the, we've gotten the ball moving and we've gotten a black politics that's organized around a, like a concrete demand that puts money into black people's politics. So it's not big. It's like talking about like getting anti-lynching bills in 1910. People are gonna, people, are, people in the South in 1910 are just gonna be like, look, you're just gonna have to be quiet around white people. They're always gonna be lynching us. Now that's not the case. And it's because of a black politics and black politics looks like a lot of things, but it's because of black organizing that we've, we've, lower the number of black people hanging from trees. And that means something. We can get reparations. We can, I think we can muscle the Democratic Party. I've already seen signs of them moving locally where I've been moving. And I think we can do this nationally, too. Um, it's just going to take a black politics that ignores um, the black functionaries like Oprah and Shonda Rhimes and Kerry Washington who are paid to get, and Wendy Williams or Charlemagne the God, to, who are paid to get black people not to talk about reparations and not to make a concrete demand. And to, and, or like, look, this is a cunning media play by white capital. They'll get black conservatives to tell you that consuming power and we can economically boycott um, our way into community up, uplift by just changing the way our consumptive habits. They'll even tell, and look, look where that argument leads you. That argument leads you that if we, to the place where if we change our consuming habits, we won't get shot anymore by cops. Like that's, that's nonsense. Um, and then they'll get the liberals to tell you that like, well, we're post-racial. We don't, you don't, the problem with race is that people talking about race. And um, you just need to like worry about yourself and like, you know, put your vision board and uh, just understand your struggle as like all women or understand your struggle as all people um, and uh, just vote and vote Democrat. Don't ask for reparations. Don't be divisive. Um, and if you watch that, if you watch that unity talk from the left, if you let them do it from the Clinton group of the left, the center left, if you watch that unity talk, they'll unify you right out of your justice claim. They'll unify you right out of your specific justice claim. And we cannot let that happen. We have a particular justice claim, and we can't let them unify us out of it. So if we have our backbone, um, when we deal with our local politics and our local politicians, we can get this um, um, on the docket again. Because it was there until, like it was there in the form of affirmative action in a way, but it was there until like we just let the Clintons talk us out of our, like in 92, um, talk us out of like the justice claims were deserved. So that's what I think. We have a way in. I think it's by muscling the Democratic Party or threatening to just sit out elections and let them lose. And um, it's by putting our own people up. It's by organizing. Consuming power is not power. Power is in production. And the only way we're going to get enough investment capital in the black community to produce at a level that lifts the community is by using political power. And political power happens through organizing. That's my answer to the question. As the separatist movements, like white people are not going to give up their land. 
Like, separatist movements, that's going to take gunfire. Um, like, I just don't see white people giving up their farms. Uh, all right. So we're going to keep going and take another call. Hello, uh, you're on there. Yeah, hey, what's up? Ernie. Yeah. What's up? Hey, Ernie. Uh, my name, uh, not much. I just want to talk to you. My name is Bernie. Uh, I know what you're saying because you got to remember that a lot of the things that we went through during slavery, Jim Crow, all of this, and plus, even in Africa, a lot of us like to talk about Africa, like to talk about how it's one of the most wealthy countries in the world, but we, we need to understand that there's so many people profiting off of our own pain and suffering. Yes. That we need to somehow consolidate consolidate our own efforts in fighting freedom. Yes. And another thing we need to understand is everyone is our ally. <laughs> you know, we like to we like to see other people as our allies. Even if you want to talk about Afro Latinos or uh people from Brazil or South America, you gotta also remember that a lot of them have been affected by white supremacy and a lot of them have a certain outlook on themselves that is a productive stuff. So I think we need to come together as black Americans, as Red always likes to say, we're, we're the tribe, our tribe is here. Yes. Right? Yeah, I'm American. Over from the slave ship. Yeah, my color is right. Tribe. I'm American. So I think we need to come, we all need to come together and consolidate our efforts. And we need to go in the thing about the thing about politics that even when you're talking about the Bernie Sanders wins a party and even if you want to talk about Hillary and everything with this election, there's a one thing we need to realize what you're talking about uh, right now when you're talking about saying opportunity, this right now is a perfect opportunity because we're seeing a divide in both parties. Right. So you have the Bernie and the Hillary uh, part of the party. We and have leverage. Yeah. Hillary is a corporatist. Good. Bernie, yeah. Bernie, Bernie in reality is a socialist. Yeah. Yeah, we have love it. And, and we need to remember, even if you're coming off the civil rights movement, you had a lot of leaders like Angela Davis yeah. or the Communist Party. Yeah, yeah. So we can use. Nobody's so blacker than her. We come together yeah. with something like the Socialist Party and then basically influence to our benefit. I think it would be beneficial. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look, people, Angela Davis joined the Communist Party. Martin Luther King was a socialist at the end of the life. Like, that's, like, nothing wrong with socialism. We need to get in with the people who are worried about our people. <laughs> like, and uh, right now, the Democratic Party is vulnerable. It's vulnerable. And we have more power there than I've, we've had in my lifetime. I'll be honest. Like, where the black people go in, in the Democratic Party for the next you know, two election cycles is where the Democratic Party is going to go. And that's why the Democratic Party is going to put so much money into getting black people to unify under the Clinton wing, which is going to not ask for anything except like symbolic Symbolic. That means more black faces in high places, but not like black money and black contracts in black communities. Like any, stru any scheme for black community uplift that has to do with just getting like the best and brightest Negroes and putting them in Ivy League schools, that's not a scheme for community uplift. That's not a scheme for community uplift. Any scheme that like, Look, all right, so there are, th there are three programs, uh, the Crime Bill, Welfare Reform, and uh, the Charter School Program. Those are three programs. All three of those programs have been schemes by the center left, the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party, to, uh, to uh, pit a war against the black striving middle class, against the black poor. Though all three of those, Welfare Reform, um, the Crime Bill, and Charter Schools, they want to pit the black middle class against the black poor. That's not a strategy for community uplift. That's a strategy for just like cherry picking Negroes and, um, and then sending the rest to jail. 
We need a strategy that's serious about community uplift. That means like unionized black veteran teachers in our schools and public schools that even like, you know, all black students get decent education with small class sizes and access um, equal opportunity for like access to the quality of education it de they deserve as Americans. And to re and let's be honest, after 400 years of cultural decimation and chattel, and chattel slavery onto like domestic terrorism, we're going to have to spend more money educating black kids than we do their white counterparts. That's the cost of treating people like garbage for 400 years. It's going to cost more money per pupil. And we just need to talk about it like that. Um, and then make it come due. And we do have that political power. We do have that political power if we actually like ask for more than symbolic representation from our um, representatives. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next caller. Hey, caller, what's up? Hey. Hey. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. Yeah, what's going on? Yeah, I'm here. Uh oh. Am I going to have to cut you off, man? I got to keep the show moving. All right. Nice try. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, hello, good evening. Yeah. Hey, I just want to say, um, first of all, I, this show is between you. Event and Antonio Moore, you guys have been like an asset of phenomenal uh, information to talk about. Thank you. Uh, what you guys are hitting on. Yesterday, I just wanted to kind of provide some information on what people talk about, what a reparation program looks like. Yeah, what's up? Um, what's the Saturday evening, I came across a piece of information on the, the Institute of Historical Review, and it talks about the reparation program that one, this is one country now. That generally provided for the Jewish community. Yeah. And the generally that actually negotiated and even basically the Martin Luther King uh basically the Jewish community and whatnot. He spoke on it and he said that the goods that we will receive from Germany were the sense of economic factor in its development. I don't know where the economic danger, I mean where the economic agents might have been, but he said had it not been for Germany. There would be no Israel. Is that the Germans? Are there any companies that we have here? Are made in Germany. The dark installation and irrigation plants were made in Germany. Right. The, right. The, I mean, they, they went on and talked about the um, the personal instance, like the personal reinvestment that they gave. A lot of people don't even talk about the steps and they, they, they hit on that. No, oh, anyway, Germany alone, this doesn't include all the other countries that well, part of the, you know, the active fire that they into it. Generally alone, between 1956 and 1984, paid out billion right. marks and reimbursement. Right. Uh, if you go to you, you, the current um, exchange rate that you can look at, at that time period, $30 yeah. billion dollars in that time period of yeah. $15 billion with inflation, right. $848 billion in the rent payment Thank you. He's right. Like, look, there's a history of reparations in the world. Like, don't let anyone tell you that this every every war, like World War II, depending on who you talk to, was like fought because the Germans resented paying reparations from World War One. Like, there's a history of reparations um, in order to bring about peace, in order to make a situation whole. Don't let anyone tell you that what we're asking for when we're asked for justice, to make our situation whole, because our situation is not whole, the legacy is still with us, and it's like, that's the faith, it's the, the legacy of black poverty um, is directly um, tied to state policies. And the United States is with us because states don't die like businesses and people do. They just kind of stay with us. So the United States is still with us. Its policies directly 
Uh, and, and Rothstein just wrote a book about this called The Color of Law. Its policies directly account for um, black current poverty and the lack of ge the generational poverty. And it actually accounts for uh, non-black wealth that actually made money from black poverty. Black poverty is lucrative. It's lucrative to, to have us rent um, in your buildings and, um, you know, be your stool pigeons. It's lucrative. The call. Yeah, what's up? Oh, okay. The recap, the call. Uh, the, the caller was talking about uh, the history of, 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 of reparations in the world. And he's talking about, look, Germany paid reparations um, to like, descendants of the Holocaust in the tunes of billions of dollars, and yet their economy is doing fine. Look, the United States, according to the estimate, has $90 trillion in private wealth. That means you, all them Americans... Find the estimates, $90 trillion in private wealth. And that wealth is white wealth. Let's be honest, it's white wealth. It's old money. That's what old money um, looks like. And that's a lot of money. <laughs> old money in America is a lot of money. There's not a lot of old black money. And even what old mo um, black money, that's the thing about old black money, it runs out. Old money, old white money doesn't run out. It just grows. So to say that a wealth tax, um, not an income tax, a wealth tax is out of, out of is, as, is, isn't, is unreasonable, is just like not honest about, one, the fact that there's private wealth to the tune of $90 trillion and the entire US economy was built um, like largely on the cotton economy, but on like the free labor of, of the slave economy. Imagine what you can do, black people. Imagine what you could do with slaves, with free labor. If you had, if you had three, free lab, three free people um, for a year, what, what, kind, what you could build with just like free labor. Like black people, when their bodies were property, was like the biggest asset in these, in these United States. Like... Land and black bodies that work the land. That was more than tools or like ores. Like. So we have $90 trillion in private wealth. We could tax that. We can get some of that money back and get it back to the people who are owed. Um, yeah. We're going to go with uh, one more caller, and then we're going to thank you for the show. Oh, uh, maybe two more. I see two for Chicago. I'm going to Chicago in a few weeks for the People's Summit. So we'll see. Hello. Hey, Chicago, you're on the line. Oh, I'm on the air. Yeah, you're on the air. Hello? Yes. Yeah, I said I'm going to the air, but I thought of it. Really quick, um, three things. Number one, I don't think Yvette and Boyce are, uh, have contradictory positions. I think their positions actually complement one another. And I wish black influencers could, you know, take almost like an oath to not be in public so much. I wish they could get together behind the scenes, discuss their differences, and then it become public with what the resolution has been. For example, um, I think for the, if we get the reparations and we develop this good black politics and everything like that. Then we need what businesses. Is that, what, 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 what is the black community going to look like once we get it? It's going to be black people owning their own businesses, uh, recirculating the dollar, having different consumption patterns, so on and so forth. So what both Watkins is doing is preparing people so that if we go on reparations, we have a cadre of black people who are skilled in finance and business and so on and so forth. So I don't think that the positions that are, are contradictory, I think that's complimentary. That's one to the last point is um, um, solution. Whenever anyone brings up or asks uh, and it's only you guys have a solution, you say, well, first thing is you have to come and understand what the problem is. And that's true. But now you guys have done such an excellent job of articulating your position. There are a number of people who understand what the problem is. But don't put it back on us and say, well, you know, you're asking for something to the students. You just say you don't know. You say that uh, I don't know, but now that we've educated you, we want to get your insights and your ideas for what the solutions are going to be, because you're going to have to um, 
um, um, if they're coming out of a black collective and not just a few people in front of the media telling us what to do, things to change now, and the solution is when it's come out of a collective black like talk. So huh. I'm going to make those comments and get your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, caller. We have great callers here. All right. So, um, all right, so the solution is going to be a black politics. The question is why I, you know, why I kind of like found, like hustled and got, um, um, hustled and, and like tried to put this together and why I work with a vet and like a lot of this is just donating my time and, and, and trying to, to make this work. The aim of this program is to increase your capacity to govern. The aim of this program is not to like necessarily raise a vet's profile so you see her on TV and we create another black, you know, mega superstar or whatever. A vet's great. I think she's like one of the most talented minds and definitely one of the most talented mouths I've ever come, uh, come across. But um, the aim of this program isn't like isn't to like raise her for the sake of raising her. The aim of this program is to increase your capacity to govern, to increase your capacity to hold your leaders accountable for the black politics we need to get the capital into the communities that we deserve. Not just the capital, but the justice in our communities that we deserve. Like that's the difference between an activist and an organizer. I don't just want you to to be able to speak truth to power, <coughs> like an activist does, you know, yelling. I want you to be able to govern. I want you, because you watch this program, to be able to like run for office and actually be the person who advocates for um, contracts to come into black communities, to advocate for, uh, you know, audits of the banks to make sure that the banks are lending to black businesses. All right, so, Remember, the aim of this program is for black politics. And that means the aim of this program is to increase your capacity to govern. That's what all black institutions should be doing. I, let me bring this home again. That's what all black institutions should be doing. I went to a church, University Church in Chicago. It was a good black institution. How do you know that it was a good black institution? It increased the congregants capacity to govern. That means it taught us that loving our neighbor meant organizing with our labor, our neighbors and being one of the major organizers along with Fearless Leaders for the Youth and Soul and a lot of other organizations on the south side of Chicago in order to pressure the University of Chicago, put political pressure on the University of Chicago um, to allow or to um, have the University of Chicago put a level one trauma center in um, uh, the University of Chicago hospitals. That was the result, partially with the result of a black institution, the black church being about its business, which was, and it's not just a black church, that was an integrated church, but it was about its business, which means it grew its congregate's capacity to organize, to govern. So all black institutions, all black institutions should be growing your capacity to govern. Your book club, your investment club, your committee, your Brick and Brown Watch Party should be growing your capacity to govern. And that's what we're here to help you do. And that's, that's our gift. Now, my problem, I have a different problem. I have, I mean, Yvette and I have problems, different problems with, with um, Dr. Watkins, I actually think, uh, I actually think getting this out in public is important because false unity isn't really unity. That's like people who tell you you should take care of this behind doors. Those are the same people who tell you you shouldn't tell your colleagues what you make. Like that's just a scam to keep you like keep a false unity. Tell your colleagues what you make. Everybody should be sharing salaries because if you share salaries, that means you can get all, all get on the same power, uh, page and organize for justice and fairness in the workplace. <clears throat> so I think some, some, some internal um, um, problems should be shared. That's why I applaud Monique for sharing her problem with Oprah. And I actually don't like Boyce Watkins for a few reasons. Like he's telling black people, one, their problem is that they're, they're, they're buying Jordans and they're buying weaves. First of all, all black people aren't buying Jordans. I will say a lot of black women are buying weaves, but all black people are not buying Jordans. Two, that's not real money. If it takes $30,000 to actually get like a real business, 
Um, let's, like, weave money isn't the reason why black people aren't in the game. They're not in the game because they're two generations away from sharecroppers. Like, they're not in the game because we're only in about 13 different occupations in the United States. Um, we're not in the game for generational reasons. It's not because of the Jordans, and it's not because of the weave. And that goes under the notion, and this is the po most powerful notion that like, I, I take issue with um, people like Dr. Watkins. And he, is, he does have a PhD from, in finance, um, but like, I, don't, I don't know how much money he has. Um, they're the kind of people who tell you that black consumption is real power. If we change our consumption habits, we'll actually be like, we'll actually be fine. And that's just not true. We can't consume our way out of this problem. Our problem isn't our consumption habits. Depending on who you talk, to, depending on which, actually everyone says the same thing, depending on which um, income bracket you look at, black people save better than white people. So like, it's not our consumption power. Have you seen what white people throw their money on? Like, Black people, are, are, we're not poor because of the joints. We're poor because we come from poor people or we're related to poor people and we're constantly having to bla uh, bail those poor people out. Um, so, people like Boyce will tell you that like, it's your consumption habits while telling you to buy his, um, you know, his, his uh, courses online or his whatever. Um, I'm telling you, it's not our consumption habits. It's the fact that we don't have enough investment capital to be producers, to be real producers. Um, and we don't have, or if we do have the investment capital to be real producers, we don't have the investment capital to afford the lawyers when people like Zuckerberg or uh, Google or Peter Thiel decide that they just want to take whatever we produce. Uh, we don't have the, law of, uh, my, uh, the capital of the political um, power to actually control what we produce. Like, I'm right here at the, the mercy of, of YouTube, and that's just my life. Um, because they have the distribution that will get to more black people. So, that's a good show. Thank you for coming. Thank you for spending your, your Memorial Day with us here. Uh, thank you for, for allowing me to step in for a vet. Remember, what I said here was representative of my thoughts, not a vet. We agree on many things, and I support a vet. I am her sidekick, um, uh, but like these opinions are my own. I have a different. I have a website at uh, thefunkyacademic.com, www.thefunkyacademic.com, where you do some of my videos. Uh, we see some of my videos where I I talk to people about academic issues and how that kind of relates to um, black politics or like just black life. Um, but I hope to see you Wednesday, and if you like what we're doing here and you support independent media, go to www.breakingbrown.com, sign up for a vet's newsletter, go into the site, and then sign up for a monthly um, contribution. I'm not going to say this is going to make you a millionaire, and, you know, um, I'm not selling you anything. I'm telling you, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get black political education. And the aim of this black political education, and we want to do it at a higher quality, is to increase, increase your capacity to govern. Thanks.